Welcome back to All Church Sunday School and our series on some of our favorite scriptures. You have been so kind uh, to let us know what you'd like to hear in the discussion. And we have this, this will be our final um, episode in the series. And I have Jamie Plunkett Hello. with me. Always, you? always here with me. Yes. And we're talking it, we're going back to Romans now. Romans chapter 12, you and a very interesting away. conversation. I'm grateful to Maggie Thomas mm -hmm. for helping us make some connections about this passage that you will discover at, in this conversation yes. uh, today. So we're glad that you're here to join us, and we hope you have your Bible open to Romans 12. Um, and we're looking forward to um, what we're going to discover about a fairly amazing but very popular passage. I'm betting that Romans 12 is one of your go-to lessons for youth ministry. It certainly is when we are starting to getting to that point with young people that they're starting to feel out how their faith manifests in the real world. And all right, so if God has equipped me to do things, like what are those gifts and how do they show up and how do I use them, that kind of stuff. So yeah, Romans 12 is definitely one of those big uh, places that we go to start to talk about all of the different various ways that we can live out our faith. A popular text for Laity Sunday. Yes. If When churches celebrate that every year, mm -hmm. it explains that we've all got something to contribute mm -hmm. uh, to the body of Christ. So we're looking at uh, the first eight verses of chapter 12, uh, Romans 12, five through six, we read says, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. And it explains and helps us understand um, what it means to really be a faith community. Mm -hmm. I think when I read those verses, it also is about God's plan for us to be in community in a way so that we know each other well. You know, we, you and I have used a lot of times examples of going on a mission trip. Yes. At, if you spend a week out in some distant place, mm -hmm. sleeping on bunk beds, sharing meals together, and doing some work, you get to know the differing gifts of the people on your team. Absolutely. And if you, we had a, a practice at the church that I served in Kingwood of adult mission trips, because when I moved from youth minister to senior minister, mm -hmm. mission trips is the one thing I did not want to give up. So I thought, you know what? I bet adults could go off on a mission trip. Oh, yeah. And we would um, get to know various talents. And as we planned the work, say, hey, we're going to need Jeff Mm -hmm. for this. I mean, we would know that Jeff would be able to do the carpentry and that somebody else would be really great for having a meal ready for us when we got back Absolutely. off the work site. And so um, I think church for me, the best part of church for me is to be in close enough relationships mm -hmm. that we know where the skills are, yeah. that we appreciate the differences instead of being irritated by them. <laughs> and um, that, you know, we see this Romans 12 being lived out when the church is working right. Absolutely. Do you think that's true? Totally. Uh, you know, and it, even if there are folks who have not experienced a week-long trip like that, there are those opportunities that come pretty frequently, uh, depending on your congregation, or for you to dive into a big project with a group of people. And, you know, even if it's, you know, one of the non-mission trip examples that I think of every year is when we get together uh, as a men's ministry to build the boar's head stage. Yes. And all of the complications that come with getting every piece in the right spot and the number of people that you need to lift all of that stuff and get it set up perfectly and all the different charts and the maps that you're looking at. And just, it's kind of like a beehive. Everybody's kind of moving and doing their role and getting everything done. And you've got folks who are climbing up under things to, to make sure that they're strapped in place. Other people that are kind of lifting the heavy pieces and and does it, it work is. for somebody brand new to show up for that task? It does, because there are the, the people who have been doing it long enough know how to do it well enough that they can say, hey, plug in here. 
this is where we really need someone right That's now. That's a great example. Uh, and so it's, you kind of have some really good leadership, you know, John Andrews, Frank Perry, Greg Lehman, those guys that are there every single year, uh, helping make that work happen. Um, it is a fun, fun thing to participate in. Um, you know, we, you know, a little disappointed we don't get to do that this year. I know that makes this yeah. year different from any <clears throat> other year and almost 50 years. So, yeah. but that's a great example. Well, we're back in Romans again. Yes. Have we been in Romans more than one time? We've, we've popped in and out of Romans even when we've been looking at other verses because of how many significant connections there are between this Romans letter. Romans is so and other influential. Parts of the Bible. Well, I did a, a, a little bit more a detective work, and here's okay. here's a few things that I learned from another source looking at Paul's letter to the church in Rome. Um, this source said, because of manuscripts, there are actually three different versions of Romans. There's a short one, a really long one, and a medium-sized one. And what we have in uh, our Bibles, what's kind of the approved canon, is the longer version. I think that's right. Let me see how many. I'm looking to see now how many. 16. Chapter 16 is the controversial one. Yes. Is this actually other writing from Paul that didn't get delivered as a letter to the church in Rome. Mm. And so we're feeling good about chapters one through 15 and the benediction being what was actually received by the church in Rome. We do not know, I discovered, um, how the church in Rome got founded. It wasn't founded by Paul Mm -mm. or Peter. We think it, we know that it existed before uh, the year 49 in the common era because of something that's said in the book of Acts. Um, but we don't know exactly how the church came to be in Rome. We believe that Paul wrote the letter uh, sometime between 55 and 58. And we be- we see many ways that Romans is unlike any other, and you and I have talked about this before, it doesn't really align with any other letter by Paul. It's mm-hmm. fairly unique, but it also is really personalized to address some problems the church in Rome was having. Yeah. I would like to know where, how the church of, in Rome came to be. I'm amazed that we d- don't have some little clues I mean, to tell s- us about that. When it's such a significant letter, and Rome, just at this time, in this time period, is such a significant place to not know is really Seems like, yeah, that's really surprising, surprising to me. You mm-hmm. have any comments on that? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, it, I agree that it does take on this kind of unique flavor in all of Paul's writings. And I wonder if that's because it is a place that he is unfamiliar with. You know, when we look at Corinthians or Thessalonians or Galatians, he has such an intimate relationship with the people in that church. And you can feel that come out in the writing. But with Rome, like you said, he doesn't really know them. He hasn't visited them yet. And I wonder how, since it does address real concerns, what was his source for knowing what was going on Mm -hmm. in that church? How did Paul know what he needed to address to a group of people he hadn't met yet. It's true. He was hoping to be there for a visit, but at the time he's writing this. So mm-hmm. so I think even, I want us to start because before we get to the many differing gifts, mm-hmm. there's some really great verses here there are. leading into it. So I, I hope it's okay for us to just kind of uh, have a few appetizers before yes, we get to the main I thing. Love that, yeah. So will you read Romans 12, 1 through 2, and I, then let's stop and talk about it. For sure. Romans 12, 1 through 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, which is good and acceptable and perfect. I love this. In verse two, do not be, con- that is a yes. huge, that is a big, big, big That hit. goes back to my time in youth ministry as mm-hmm. I was, as I was growing up mm-hmm. because it was this challenge yeah, not to be swayed by the culture around you, mm-hmm. but to understand that you had the ability to be transformed. Yes. Well, there's just this indicator in the word transform that says what's happening right now isn't good enough. And so, and but there is an opportunity to kind of rise to something greater. 
Um, you know, I think when we start to really talk about this idea of transformation now, it has taken on uh, a, an interesting flavor because it really is identifying this shift from what do I believe about who God is to how does what I believe about who God is impact who I am? And so it's this transformation almost from theology to ethics where we shift into, all right, well, now that mm -hmm. I believe this, I have to do something. We've, you know, we've talked about it a lot on this show. We've got to live out the things that we believe in our head and our heart. And so this idea of transforming and not conforming is really that very significant call to do just and that. And that's a very, um, that aligns nicely with the commentaries that I read that say in chapter 12, Paul goes from doc teaching doctrine to ethics, mm -hmm. to the living of our lives yeah. as, as followers of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. it's, so, you know, you could write your own commentary someday. I, I probably, it probably wouldn't sell, <laughs> you know, if we're just being completely honest. Uh, but, it, you know, it, it reminds me of uh, what my old senior pastor used to say, Reverend Dr. Doug Skinner, where, you know, the hardest, the hardest journey to make, on, the hardest journey of faith to make is, is the 12 inches from your head to your heart. Because we can think all of these things are true and we can reason and logic all of these things. But I don't know that the transformation and the ethics part of this, the living it out part of this actually happens until we hold that, that truth in our heart. Um, and that is something that uh, is very much not conforming to this right. world is to hold something like that, hold that truth so closely and so intimately uh, that it makes you kind of, you know, push back on what you're seeing. I just love this verse too. And and how do you explain being a living sacrifice to the young people that you're in relationship with it here? So, you know, when we think of sacrifice, I think we often find a really narrow definition to, you know, like the way that Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac or all of the other mm -hmm. kind of animal sacrifices that we read in the Hebrew scriptures, um, or even the way that Jesus sacrifice was sacrificed. Um, but I think when we talk about a living sacrifice, especially with our youth, we talk about all of those things that we want to do versus all of those things that we should be doing or need to do. Um, and how do we discern those things? Well, it all goes back to what you believe about who God is and what God is up to. Um, you know, so in one of our community groups, we, uh, our high school community groups, they really love to be challenged by con like scriptures that have really big questions uh, or draw really big questions. And so we were actually looking at, a, at Romans 8, where it talks about burnt, putting, uh, pouring burning coals mm -hmm. on your enemies. Um, and it's like, all right, well, what do burning coals represent and all this other kind of stuff. But I digress. The, the gist of that conversation was to say, you know, we can either commit to perpetuating the things that we see in the world, you know, and just con contributing to the chaos or we can make the choice to opt out of that cycle and do something different. And when we start to do something different, that's when the people around us start to transform as well. Um, and so it is really this idea of sacrificing our, our wants, our willingness to, to live into the things that we see around us, or even just, you know, it's easier sometimes just to do what everyone else is right. doing um, and saying, no, I'm going to, I'm going to step back. I'm going to do things a little bit differently, knowing that there's going to be a cost to that. Uh, people are going to look at you a little bit differently. People might not want to associate with you as much anymore. Uh, and, and so that's that's and kind of are you willing about. to mm -hmm. yeah to so. to do that even if it <clears throat> impacts? I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hearing this kind of rhythm of moving in or pulling back. Yeah, that is a part of how we live mm -hmm. out our faith. And it's it. it it could be easy, though, to say, like, pulling back is the way that we live out our faith exclusively. But there is this need to also, like, right. once you've pulled oh, right. back, you've got to get back in there. Right. Like, you're because still... your witness, mm -hmm. it's difficult to witness to the people around you when if you're, you're totally isolated. Yeah. So, right. You've, you've got to be engaged, but mm -hmm. you've got to know where you're headed. All sure. right. So, see, look, the first two verses, really great. <clears throat> now read for us verse number three. I can do that. Romans chapter 12, verse three. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. 
Now, when I hear this verse, I think Paul is addressing one of the problems of the church in Rome. Doesn't mm -hmm. this sound fairly specific? <clears throat> We've got maybe some people yeah. who are a little arrogant yeah. about their their mm -hmm. place on the food chain, and he's sort of bringing them down a notch. This sounds like it's a reaction to something. Well, I mean, it could it could even just be a reaction to the advice that he's giving in verses one and two, because if you think about um, the attitude that can come along with being different and saying, "Oh, well, look at look at me. I'm not, I'm not committed. I'm not doing the things that y'all are doing. I'm not perpetuating these cycles that are destructive and harmful. And look at me. Look how good I am. Look how holy I am. Yeah. Look how faithful I am." And Paul um, is saying, "Get over yourself." That's, that's not the attitude that you should have when you're doing this work. Well, and um, isn't it interesting, the phrase at the end of verse three, the measure of faith that God has assigned. Isn't yeah. that an interesting phrase to think, um, however faithful yeah. we might think we are, mm -hmm. that actually it's about God's plan. It's not about our, yeah. our trying to go up a notch in our faithfulness that... God has planned all of this out. And, and it's not it's also not God has made one person more faithful than another. It is God has called us all to do specific things. That's right. And that and the way that we live into those things that God has called us to do, uh, you know, that, that that's kind of our assignment from God. That yeah. seems like that actually should allow us all to kind of relax a little bit. We don't have to and listen we don't closely have to do it. for God's yeah. plan for us and not be, mm -hmm. oh man, I'm I'm an underachiever in terms of my faith. God's got a plan. God's God has called us to something specific, yes. And I think, too, it, it means that I don't have to worry about doing it all. I just got to cover my own little corner. Like right. I don't have to worry, oh, I've got to also do the things that God has called Renee to do. Because if Jamie is trying to do the things that God has called Renee to do, it's then probably going to do your Jamie stuff. And it's probably also the stuff I'm trying to do is going to burst into flames because you're the one that's supposed <laughs> to be doing it. Right? That's and right. So, that's right. Um, just It's almost like a stay in your lane situation. <laughs> that's way before we ever use that phrase. Yeah. That's what Romans 12 is really mm -hmm. about. Stay humble. Stay in your lane. Stay in your lane yeah. and understand God's plan. Mm -hmm. All right. Now we're to verses 4 through 5. Okay. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individuals we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us according to the grace given to us, which is a little bit different than the measure of faith God has assigned to us. Yes. But still, this sense of mm -hmm. of grace being how we're equipped, Yeah. and grace comes from God, and we understand it through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is that um, we are many, but we are one. Yeah. And, and how how amazing that is when we can get those two things mm -hmm. right. I love the, this reminds me of the communion hymn, One Bread, One Body, uh -huh. um, where this there's this theme of unity that happens when we all gather around the table together and hear God's call for us as individuals and as a community. Um, because I think there's, I don't know all the lyrics to that, um, him off the top of my head. We should probably have Todd here for this conversation since he's yes. our expert, but um, there's never in that <clears throat> hymn any call for uniformity, but it is this idea that we are united in the way that God has called us. Um, we are united in uh, this bread and in this cup. Um, and then you know, we don't stay at the communion table forever, but we go back out into the world to live out the things that God has called each of us to do. And we don't go to the same workplace. We don't go to the same home. We don't go to the same school. We we have our own spaces where God's grace um, reaches us and calls us to do the things that we're supposed to do. And if we get the alignment right, mm -hmm. then God, God's grace, God's <clears throat> power pours through us out into the world. And all we have to do is just be aligned. Absolutely. And sometimes, and, and getting out of alignment just means a correction. Mm -hmm. It is really nice and comforting, in my opinion, to know that the the onus of all of this is not on me, right? Like I am, I am riding up alongside God for a little while, 
for however long I'm on this planet to do the things that God is asking me to do specifically with the understanding, you know, and it goes back to the mission trip mentality too. We show up, but God's already been here. And when we're right. gone, God will continue to be here and work. We're just riding up alongside God for a little while to do the things that God is calling us to do, to be a good, faithful partner. And you know, that's it. That's really it. I think, I think that's, look, there's the book if you want to look up the words. Oh, to. yes. Thank you, Jack. Jack right. is so handy. That is amazing. And it's the big print one, too. <laughs> this must be Russ's copy. Um, I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> But yeah, so when we get, so we have the refrain, the one one bread, one body, one Lord of all, one cup of blessing, which we bless. And we, though many throughout the earth, we are one body and this one Lord. And then it goes through and it lists Gentile or Jew, servant or free, woman or man, um, many the gifts, many the works, one in the Lord of all. Um, and so it is really this beautiful exposition of, hey, look at how different we all are. Look how God created us all to be unique. And yet we are all a part of this one body of Christ. I knew that that yeah. was going to come up. There we go. Thank you, Jack. All right. So we have, before we <clears throat> conclude, we have um, verse six here. Yes. Where Paul lists mm -hmm. some of the ways to be deployed. Oh, you want to know how you're different? I'll tell you. Uh, we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry and ministering the teacher and teaching, the exhorter and exhortation, the giver and generosity, the leader and diligence, the compassionate and cheerfulness. So just an idea of how we will be equipped mm -hmm. and those being the list that Paul shared with us. Now, one of the things that Maggie told us, did you know before Maggie uh, shared this with us about the Myers-Briggs connection? I didn't. I mean, I, I, I saw hints of them kind of intersecting, but I never really put my finger on it. Well, this is amazing. Um, Catherine Cook Briggs and her daughter, Isabel Briggs Myers, um, studied human behavior, Carl Jung's psychology, psych psychological types, and they are the creators of the Myers-Briggs type indicator. I bet a lot of people who are part of this conversation have know what their Myers-Briggs mm -hmm. type is. Yes. That was a process that we had in seminary mm -hmm. as we were being equipped for ministry. Do you know what your Myers-Briggs is? I do. I do too. <laughs> I think we're the same. Well, no, but recently I retested and one of mine changed. Oh, so what are you now? So it changed to ENTP. Oh, okay. So I am still an ENFP. So we're, but we're it's, bo it's borderline okay. and it's, and it's so interesting. We live in a time <clears throat> when, uh, understanding, uh, what your personality, what your leadership style, I mean, mm -hmm. there are lots of tools it's available true. now, but this was the earliest run, I believe. And you can see in, in the picture, uh, the mother daughter, mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, when you, uh, look at, uh, photographs, this one is used a lot, even though clearly they weren't working on this in that picture because she's a little girl, but mm -hmm. the daughter grew up um, to write a book, Gifts Differing, and the okay. title for her book comes from Romans chapter 12. And I looked inside the book um, to, just to get a little, I haven't, I don't have the book to get a sense of the flavor of the book. And her son, um, Isabel Briggs Myers was, um, struggling for 20 years with cancer as she was writing this book, I found out. And she actually died before the book was published oh, really? in 1980. And in a subsequent publication, uh, her son, uh, who is on the cover as working with her on the book, uh, wrote um, something that I thought was really interesting. This was him writing in 1995. Uh, this is in the preface. A common problem that has often led to stress for many of us is our, our apparent inability at times to communicate about something that's very clear and personally very important to us to someone we care about in a way that that person agrees or at least understands its importance to us. Mm -hmm. We may feel hurt and rejected by the lack of recognition of our concern. Or we may feel baffled by the failure of that person to appreciate the logic of our position. 
in Gifts Differing, Isabel Myers, his mom, gives us recognizable explanations for these and many other normal but different uses of our personality tools and points the way to constructive uses of human differences. And then you'll see here on the next slide um, in the um, fly leaf at the front of the book is this uh, a different translation, but Romans 12, four through eight. I think this translation is kind of interesting, obviously an older one. For as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing. And gifts differing is the name uh, of the book. Perfect. And um, a classic um, that has long before we got so consumed with mm -hmm. knowing about our type and our style and all of that stuff. This was kind of on the frontier of all that. Yeah. Clearly, she was a, a woman who was familiar with scripture as well as her study of psychology. Mm -hmm. And so um, this whole idea of personality indicators also validates what Paul was teaching yeah. so, so much earlier about the ways we are equipped, um, the ways that God's grace works through us mm -hmm. in the world. So I loved finding out that connection about Myers-Briggs. That is really incredible. Um, I also love this translation that uh, Peter Myers uses uh, because now I'm thinking about all of the clergy at UCC sharing an office like an actual physical one office, and what would that look like for us <laughs> if we all had the same office? Um, that would be a crazy, that would be a distracting place very to be. chaotic. <laughs> it's good that we could go off and close the door offices. and allow our yeah. colleagues to actually concentrate. Yeah. I don't know that we'd be very productive all mm -hmm. in, one, in <clears throat> one space. But this brilliant, um, this brilliant teaching of Paul yeah. about what makes... What makes everything work and our willingness to be contributors um, in a way that allows us to lean into our strengths mm -hmm. and trust that somebody else is going to have what we're lacking. Well, it's interesting, too, because, you know, in this time contextually, there were such clear lines between, uh, you know, roles just societally. Um, you, you had a working class and you had an elite class and you had. So, you know, it's interesting that. When, when it comes to the religious aspect of their lives, that the folks who were practicing Christianity in Rome were struggling to identify kind of their own kind of structure and their own lines with who's doing what and how does that manifest. And um, it's just, I don't know, it's interesting. I do think that this teaching reminds us again, Paul hadn't been to visit this church yet. Mm -hmm. he, so he couldn't be more specific but he could see that there was a little bit of a power struggle. Yes. Don't you think that's oh, what it sounds sure. like Romans 12 is there, addressing? There was a power struggle issue. Uh, there was uh, maybe an arrogance issue as well. Um, and so he's just helping. I wonder if, you know, I, I wonder if, I'm assuming that Paul knew who started the church in Rome. And so I wonder if the person who started the church in Rome maybe wrote Paul and said, hey, they've got some issues. I know that you've got some really good wisdom because of the other churches that you've been providing counsel to. Would you mind writing These them a letter? These people need some help. Here are the issues that they need some help solving. Would you maybe knock a couple of them out with some, with some writing? That could very well be possible. I, I would like to know more about that. Uh, as we leave this topic... Mm -hmm. We do need to update everybody on our question at the end of our last class yes. about who was it that was that was sawn in half. Yeah, as there's it was. Some, man, there are some illustrations. We, we of this. heard from a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> People were really excited to talk about sawing folks. We in got half. more response to asking, do you know who who uh -huh. in, in, in Scripture was cut in two? We got more response to that than yeah. any question we've asked so far, mm -hmm. which should inform uh, now we know a little bit better how to uh, get some yeah, feedback. We've got, yeah, we add a little bit more gore to our conversation. So, so share what it was that we learned. We learned that Isaiah was sawn in half, and we... Also, along with that information via text format, we also 
saw some images. I went, of, at, at, as soon as I knew it was Isaiah, I w went to Google it, images. And it's just... There's all kinds of, <sighs> it looks like fairly ancient mm -hmm. drawings of whether it was cut in half by this his waist way or, or this, this way. way. The vertical one is, I don't know why, but <laughs> like getting getting sawn in half doesn't seem like a, a fantastic experience either way, but for either some reason way. vertically is much more terrifying. And, and it, sometimes it looks like in the... In the um, illustrations that it's kind of like one of those big long saws you would use on a tree yeah. with There's handles back and on forth. It. You got two people. And I know we shouldn't yeah. be laughing about poor Isaiah being cut in two, but, no, but I, I, you know. now it's all I can think about because so many people <laughs> responded to it. So we mm -hmm. do thank you for straightening us out. I we loved, should yeah. have. Well, we I should... loved opening up my email on Monday morning and just you know, the list of <laughs> folks like, who are very eager to share. Yeah, oh my good. gosh. Do that more. Share more. We love, we love, love, love communicating with y'all. It's great. Now, we'd like to tell you what's up next as we conclude this, but we're still working on it. That's that. a surprise. So this will be a cliffhanger. You Ooh. need to join us next week. And uh, we trust that you will be with us. We love this mm -hmm. conversation. We would love to hear from you. If you've got suggestions, you can always reach out to us at All Church Sunday School, ACSS at uccftw.com. We hope it's a good week for you. Stay safe, and we will see you soon.